In this video, I want to provide the proofs for Fermat's Little Theorem and Euler's Theorem. These are pretty important pro, uh, theorems from number theory, elementary number theory. They talk about uh, reduction one can do with modular exponents. But in the context of group theory, uh, these two theorems are just trivial corollaries of Lagrange's theorem. Remember that Lagrange's theorem says that if you have a subgroup of a group, then the order of H must divide the order of G. And as a consequence, if you take any element um, inside of your group, if you take a group, if you take that element raised to the G power, the order of G power, you always get the identity. And that's really the consequence we have right there. Lagrange's theorem tells us that you raise the, an element to the power of the uh, to the order of the group, you get back the identity. And Euler's identity, Euler's theorem and Fermat's little theorem are two things that are going to use that fact right there. And so while oftentimes in like a number theory course, we would first prove Fermat's little theorem for primes, and then you generalize it to Euler's theorem for composite numbers, we're going to work backwards because Lagrange's theorem, Kachink right here, already gives it to us from that direction. So we have to first introduce Euler's totient function. This is often denoted as a phi. Um, the totient function is going to be a function from the positive integers to the real numbers. Um, which admittedly, you're not going to get anything other than a whole number, but I'm defining it broadly because I'm introducing that the totient function here is an example of what's called an arithmetic function. Um, arithmetic functions are essentially these functions of this form. You take positive integers to the real numbers. Um, but more importantly, this is what we're going to call a multiplicative function. A multiplicative function. A multiplicative function uh, we'll define just in a second, uh, but the totient function does the following. If you take phi of one, we're gonna define that to be one. And for any other positive integer, phi of n is gonna be the number of positive integers that are co-prime to n when you go from zero to n, like so. And so let me give you some quick examples of that. Uh, phi of one by definition is equal to one. Phi of two is equal to one because one's the only thing co-prime to up to two. Uh, phi of three, you're gonna get two because you have the numbers one and two, which are co-prime to three. Phi of four, you're going to get likewise two because you get the numbers one and three. Uh, the issue is that two and zero, um, they're not co-prime to four, so you get just one and three. If we do, say, phi of five, you're going to get four numbers because you get zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero is never going to be co-prime, but you get four other ones, one, two, three, four. If you get phi of six, there's going to be two numbers there. So you get zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, you take away zero, two, three, and four, you're just left with one and five. And we can keep on going with these things here. You're going to get phi of seven is equal to six. Phi of eight, uh, let's see, that's equal to four, I believe. Um, and you can keep on going. Now, there's a couple tricks for computing this totient function quickly. Um, if you ever take phi of a prime number, this is always going to equal p minus 1. Because other than 0, all the numbers less than p will be co-prime to the prime. And one can generalize this principle by taking phi to the pk. Um, if you have a power of prime, this will always equal p to the k minus p to the k minus 1. And the idea is because you have a power of a prime, the only thing that would be not co-prime to p to the k would be multiples of p. And so if you count from 0 up to pk, to, to, to pk there... Uh, pk should say one less than pk. If you count all the multiples, there's going to be p to the k minus one many multiples of a prime. And so you take that difference right there. So this allows us to compute prime powers. And then another thing that I was mentioning earlier is that the phi function is multiplicative. A multiplicative function has the following uh, properties. That first of all, phi of one is always defined to be one. And then phi of a times b equals phi of a times, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll move this a little bit down, I got crowded there. So if the GCD of A comma B is equal to one, then this tells us that phi of A times B will equal phi of A times phi of B. So, and I'm not gonna prove this fact, uh, that, that's a very appropriate thing to do in like in a number, a number theory course. But what we're just saying is that if two numbers are co-prime, we can compute the phi by factoring it amongst co-prime factorizations. So for example, how do I do six? Six, which is phi of, that's gonna be phi of two times phi of three. Two is a prime number, so it's gonna be two minus one, which is a one. 
And then three is also a prime number, so it's three minus one, which is a two. One times two is equal to two. Um, how did we do eight? Well, eight as a power of a prime, you're gonna get eight minus four, which is the previous, uh, the previous power of two. So you end up with just a four right there. If we wanted to do something a little bit more complicated, like say phi of 12, it's not too complicated, but phi of 12 would look like the following. You get phi of four times phi of three. Four is a power of a prime, so it's gonna look like four minus two. And then phi is a prime itself, so you're gonna get three minus one. So you end up with two times two, which is equal to four. There's gonna be four numbers co-prime to 12, and this is gonna be one, five, seven, and 11. Those are the four numbers co-prime to 12. So calculating the totient can be very useful. Why is it so useful from a group theory perspective? Well, if you take, if you take the multiplicative group mod n, uh, we've seen that this group will all it, the, the number of elements that are in this group will be those elements co prime to n. Well, if phi counts the number of elements co prime to n, the order of this group will always be phi of n. All right, so let's now talk about Euler's theorem. Euler's theorem from number theory says the following let a and b be integers such that n is positive, and the GCD of a and n is equal to 1. Then if you take phi raised, sorry, if you take a raised to the totient of the modulus power, that is always congruent to one mod n. And how do we see this? Why is this true? Well, this comes from the following fact. If, if the GCD of a and n is equal to one, that means that a belongs to the multiplicative group zn star, which the order of zn star, as we've already mentioned, is equal to phi of n. And by Lagrange's theorem, if you take an element and you raise it to the order of the group, you always get the identity. Therefore, if you take A, which belongs to the multiplicative group, Z and star, and you raise it to the order of Z and star, you're going to get back the identity. So this is a complete a complete immediate consequences of Lagrange's theorem if you look at it in the perspective of group theory. If you wanna prove this using just uh, divisibility and number theoretic things, it's a lot harder to prove. Group theory has already done all the heavy lifting right here. And then a special case of Euler's theorem is what's referred to as Fermat's little theorem, not to be confused with Fermat's last theorem or even Fermat's Christmas theorem, uh, which are, are other related theorems in number theory. Fermat has a knack of stating theorems and number theory, but not actually proving any of them. Um, I'm not sure if he proved this one either. But anyways, we'll, we'll prove it. So if P is a prime number, and if P does not divide A, then A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. Or more specifically, it's often written, uh, I should say more specifically, it's often written in the alternative form that B to the P is congruent to B mod P. So if you raise a number to the pth power, it's used to get back the original number when you work mod P. Which I want to admit that this equation right here implies the second one very quickly because if you have A to the P minus 1, this is congruent to 1. If you times both sides by A, you'll get A to the P is congruent to A. Great. So this version right here is the immediate consequence of this version. So let's prove the first version. Uh, this is, again, an immediate consequences of Lagrange's theorem. We're actually just going to use Euler's theorem right here. Because Euler's theorem tells us the following. Phi of a prime is equal to P minus 1. We saw that already. And if P does not divide A, that actually tells us that the GCD of A and P is equal to 1. So then by Euler's theorem, this identity holds, which we already proved the second identity. And so that gives us the proof of Fermat's little theorem. Now, why are such theorems actually useful whatsoever? Well, I want to mention that Fermat's little theorem provides one of the first basic primality tests uh, that we have. Uh, primality tests. These are actually very important things uh, in, from number theory. Uh, they have some important consequences in computer science, which we'll see actually in the next chapter. Um, a primality test is a test to determine whether a number is a prime number or not. And the most naive of any primality tests is just to factor it. If you can factor a number, then you can determine whether it's a prime or not. Uh, because if it factors, then it's not prime. But the problem is when, pro when the numbers get big, right? If I come up with like some 100-digit number, factoring is going to be a brutal task. That would take a long time to do it. Is there some other way of determining whether the number is prime or not, even if we don't factor it? Well, if we are uncertain if n is a prime number, what we can do is we can compute 
So basically, this primality test that we're going to run right now is, you know, we have a number n, and we're asking, is it a prime? We don't know. So what we can do is we can then compute b to the n mod n. So we're going to compute this. And because what we're going to see is the following, is that by Fermat's little theorem, if b to the n is not congruent to b mod n, then that implies that n is not a prime number. So we can prove that a number is composite without factoring it, which is a very impressive thing. Now, in order to compute b to the n mod n, that could be, you know, n could be a very big number. And if we're running this primality test, n is probably very big. So how do we deal with something with really big exponents? Oh, well, we could use the repeated squares algorithm that we presented earlier in this lecture series. Uh, we could run this primality test by using repeated squares. So we could very quickly, I mean, because the, the complexity of repeated squares is essentially just log base 2 of n right here. It's a very fast algorithm. So we could compute these powers very quickly. Um, and so then we could determine if b of n is congruent to b or not. Now, we have to be careful. Fermat's little theorem only goes one direction. If b, if b to the n is not congruent to b, then that will tell us it's not a prime. But if b to the n was congruent to b, that doesn't tell us anything. Um, it doesn't tell us it's prime. It doesn't tell us that it's not prime. We don't know. Now, the thing is, in terms of the, the grand scheme of things, prime numbers are fairly rare. Um, basically, the prime number theorem tells us that the density of the prime numbers amongst the natural numbers is zero. So if we chose an arbitrarily large number, most likely it's not prime. And so if we were to check like, oh, b to the n, if it's if it's not equal to b, we're done. We know it's not prime. But if it, if it works, if b to the n does equal, or if it is congruent to b, then we just try a different number, like try a to the n. If that's not equal to a, then we know it's not prime. Um, but if it did equal a, then we try a different one, c to the n. Is that equal? Is that congruent to c? If not, then we know it's not prime. If it is, then we kind of keep on going, right? We can often find a number eventually. But of course, if it's a prime number, you'll never find one. And so what this primality test can do is the following. We can determine with confidence that a number is not prime, or we can determine that it's probably prime. Right. So, I mean, it's not an actual proof because this is not a this is not a necessary. Con all right, let's th this condition right here is sufficient to show that a number is composite, but it's not a necessary condition. Um, and so the fact that we can't find a number could just be that, oh, it's hard to find. So this this primality test is not the best of any primality tests because it can never prove that something's a prime. It can only prove that it's probably a prime. But the issue is the reason why we can't use this to prove exactly primes is because we have something called Carmichael numbers. Carmichael numbers are exactly those numbers which trick this primality test. Carmichael numbers are numbers which b to the n is congruent to b for any choice of b, but they themselves are, are they're, they're composite numbers. Now, the good news is prime num or Carmichael numbers are extremely rare. Um, I, I, they're even rarer than primes, I believe. Uh, I believe they're infinite. But they're they're very very sparse. So if you are if you have this primality test and it says this thing is probably prime, it's more likely prime than a Carmichael number. And in fact, you can kind of compare it. So again, this is not the most sophisticated primality test. There are much more sophisticated ones that do come from number theory. But I want to present to you just to start to think: How does one do these type of algorithms? How does one check whether a number is prime or not? Turns out Lagrange's theorem provides us a very naive way of checking whether something's a prime number or not. And I would encourage you to try to practice some of these things yourself. Uh, so you could try testing some of these things like with the computer software program Magma. A link to Magma can be found on this video right here. If you use the command mod uh, exp of a comma n comma, excuse me, a to the m comma n, this will compute, put a semicolon at the end, this will compute a to the m mod n. And so, for example, with this primality test, uh, you would put the n right here as the same number over and over again. And so you can check. You could run a for loop. Let me scroll up a little bit. You could run a for loop that basically did the following. So it's like, hmm, how do I test? How do I test if n is prime? You could run basically the following test. You could run a for loop where you're going to be like, hey, a 
we're going to go from two and we're going to run it to say like, uh, let's go to like a hundred, something like that. And then we're going to do the following. What we're going to do is we're going to compute mod. And we'll, we'll have a we'll number to represent this. So let's say that the exponent is equal to E is equal to mod exp of A comma N comma N semicolon. And then you're going to run, basically, you're going to kind of return the following, just return these values right here. Um, and so we could, I'll just kind of stick it the following way. So we're going to say A comma this, we're going to return the number. And so if these numbers are in agreement, that means that you move on to the next one. Um, and if it's not in agreement, right, we want to probably do some type of test. So like, are these things equal? If these things are equal, then we can return, if A is equal to that, then, uh, well, basically, we, we just keep on going. Um, so if they're not equal, basically, we're going to do the following. We're going to break, we're going to break the for loop. And so maybe you could do like a while loop or something if you wanted to. This is just pseudocode, so don't take it too seriously. We want to break the loop, and then we're going to basically return false in that situation, something like that. But then, um, if the for loop ends without terminating, then instead we return true. Which, of course, that's only probably true. Uh, but you know this is this is a very simple uh, primality test that one could implement either in magma or gap or basically any any um, any computer software program that can support large powers of exponents mod n.